Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for uh, the great words there uh, about uh, what the, the war that we're all uh, involved in as far as uh, health care and, and trying to take good care of patients. Um, as Keith and I um, founded the Free Market Medical Association, we did have a, uh, a very clear vision and, and really that, uh, you know, we, you all may or may not have, have heard the uh, kind of the, the story behind this, but um, when he and I uh, kind of found each other uh, through a neighbor of, of uh, Keith's, which was a client of mine. Um, when we first uh, came together, um, I remember walking into uh, their lavish uh, boardroom, uh, pulled up a folding uh, chair at the folding table, um, and we met. Uh, when we first met, you know, we kind of both had, you know, we're from Oklahoma, and so we kind of had our six shooters, you know, not drawn, but we had our hands on them because I was a TPA. I was a third party administrator, um, like Dr. Smith had uh, made comments about. Um, but I was a third party administrator that uh, he had not really been very familiar with. And it was the idea, it, it was uh, the difference there was that I was an independent third party administrator. And we are a more of a, a rare bird out there. Um, we are not owned by insurance companies. Uh, I do not get any of those lavish PPO skimming uh, kickbacks. Um, I have to rely on um, one source for my revenue, and that is I get paid by, my, by the employer. 100% of my revenue comes from the employer. And the only way that that revenue ever goes up is if I get the gumption uh, and, and feel confident enough that I've made that employer's uh, em patients and employees very happy, very healthy, and I've done that, hopefully helped them achieve that at a, at a cost uh, point that is fair and reasonable. That was kind of a unicorn um, comment uh, to, to Dr. Smith, and so after we spent a little bit of time together, talked about his vision for healthcare, and you know, I, was, I knew I was standing at, in front of a unicorn, this was the alpha and the omega. There were no more Keith Smiths and Surgery Center of Oklahoma as I was convinced of it. But before we left, we essentially uh, put a deal together with a handshake that if I could do everything that I could to make my employees, uh, the employees uh, of my employers and their families, when they come to Surgery Center of Oklahoma, we were gonna do everything we could to make that look, that transaction look, smell, and taste like somebody coming to the front desk of Surgery Center of Oklahoma and putting cash on the counter. That was my commitment um, to Surgery Center of Oklahoma. And again, with, with kind of a handshake, we said, well, that's, that's what we'll do. And if you can make it, make this look as close to cash as possible, we'll extend these prices. Kind of the rest is history. And so the Free Market Medical Association is really about figuring out how we take that relationship that formed, and I'm not the buyer, I'm a middleman, but how do I, how do we make the buyer, which are self-funded employers and sellers, which is every one of you all, uh, facility managers, specialists, et cetera, how do we streamline that transaction to where it can be literally as simple as what originally occurred between Jay Kempton and my small family-owned TPA in Surgery Center of Oklahoma? How do we spread that? So, as Dr. Smith was talking about all of the um, TPA, all the self-funded business out there and how you need to um, you know, really look to the self-funded employers, um, and he mentioned there was a, a big impediment. He, he missed one, which was actually bigger than the one he listed, and, and that is that there are a lot of uh, TPAs that are out there in the marketplace. In fact, the majority, the vast majority, that they don't call themselves TPAs. They call themselves ASOs. It's the same thing. An ASO stands for Administrative Services Only. But if you are Blue Cross, United, Cigna, or Aetna, you don't want to be associated with low life like little old Kempton Group. You would never stoop to be a TPA. <laughs> so they call themselves ASOs. And they are essentially acting as a TPA for a self-funded employer. But instead of 
being as transparent as possible. I, I, I explain to employers and, and other medical providers that I want to be like a clean, a very, very, not even a, a clear pane of glass between the, the buyer and the seller. I want to be like a screen door. The relationship is really between the, the, the medical professional and uh, the employer and the patient. Um, the ASO carriers, they put a firewall between that buyer and that seller, so much so that when you all encounter a ASO patient, they look just like Blue Cross. They look just like United, just like uh, Aetna, et cetera. Because that relationship, you don't have a relationship with the patient, you don't have a relationship with the employer. That is a Aetna network participant, right? And that's what we see out there. So that's a big distinction. Um, the, the ASO carriers, um, we, I don't look at them as even being part of my industry. Um, they may not look at being part of our industry. We're trying to get out of the way of the folks in this room and trying to get out of the way of facility uh, managers such as Surgery Center of Oklahoma. But that's not, I wanted to kind of set that, um, really what I'm here to talk to you all about is how do employers and direct primary care fit together. Employer-based plans, so self-insured plans. Now, I was here for the morning sessions, and my goodness, those speakers were so uh, just so inspirational, and, and I believe everything that uh, the, the speaker said, and I definitely do understand that there are some DPCs here in the audience that don't want to have anything to do with employers. Employers are a third party, just like the government or anything else. Totally get that. I was asked to explain this, so if, if you are, don't want to hear this, you, know, you can kind of tune out or go get a cup of coffee or whatever. But I do think that it can be done in a way that is mutually um, uh, rewarding. Uh, first, you know, these are going to be really uh, kind of uh, reviews for, for most of us, but you know, the benefits of DPC to a employee, direct primary care is, is less out of pocket less out-of-pocket costs for the, for the patient. They're not dealing with a big giant deductible that they generally can't afford. They're not dealing with all the restrictions. They're able to get more care at a lower price point. Superior care and management of chronic health conditions. I mean, you all, this is your bread and butter. You all are exceptional at this. Um, patient physician relationship is restored. And then also greater access to care. Um, you all are much more convenient. You're, you pride yourselves on accessibility. And I might want to add at, at this point that I'm not, uh, this is not just a slide here. This was a pretty easy one because for the last four years, um, myself, my wife, and my two kids have had a DPC membership. Um, we are big, big believers personally in DPC and would never, uh, never relinquish it, even though, even when it was coming 100% out of our pocket which is the purest way. For an employer, what are the benefits to an employer? Well, as Dr. Smith mentioned, it's really breaking the automatic referral funnel to the inefficient hospital systems is probably the number one. Um, you all are, you, you all have the best need, the, the, the best um, uh, wishes of the patient in mind at all times. And if upstreaming them to the big giant palace on the hill is the right way to go clinically, you all will make that call. But if it's not, we know that there's no incentive, there is no, there is no conflict in which you would make at referral unless it was absolutely necessary. In fact, under, under, you, know, you all look at things from a holistic perspective that you're gonna take care of the patient's health, but you're also gonna take care of their wallet whenever possible, and, and that's wonderful. And that, that dovetails right into what an employer wants as well. Lower claims cost when it's appropriate. Improve access to care. Decreases presenteeism. Um, presenteeism is an HR term that um, some of y'all may have not heard before, but that is what I call the walking wounded. That would be somebody that is at work because they can't get in to see a doc. And they're not thinking about work, they're not working, but they're sitting there just in a daze, uh, in a daze because they really need to probably be home in bed. Uh, and then also happier and healthier employees. That is what the ultimate goal of the employer, I, I don't have I don't work with any employers like the two that Dr. Smith gave. Uh, I don't know that I've ever worked with one of those employers because I'm, I think I'm a distinct enough flavor that if you're an employer to just deny care to your patients, um, then you, you probably know within the first 10 minutes of 
speaking with me that we're probably not going to be a good fit. I'm probably not going to be your guy. So my employers are always looking to have happy, healthy employees. That is their bottom line. Um, our employers that we do business with are exceedingly generous. In fact, the reason that they became self-funded, the reason that they uh, allow us to do their claims work, very much like Surgery Center of Oklahoma, is because they were not able to get a level of care and a level of, of, of benefit access for their patients from any of the insurance companies. And they said, we want to build a benefit plan that is better for our employees. Physician benefits, you all already know this. This is not about just DPC, though. This is with a DPC in conjunction with uh, working with employer business. And this is things that we have heard from other DPCs, so I'm not uh, injecting my own opinion in this. Uh, we hear patient panel stability. We also hear that uh, individual DPC members um, or independent DPC members that are not part of an employer don't have group health insurance are generally higher utilizers than those that are enrolled through an employer. Uh, improved diversity of individual and employer sponsor sponsored patients creates financial stability. We believe as any good DPC practice believes uh, diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversification of your panel is, is important. Some of the other benefits uh, to a DPC practice of working with employers to some extent is faster growth, uh, becoming profitable uh, more quickly, reduced collection issues. Uh, I, I don't know anything about the collection issues that a DPC faces, um, but again, these are from a DPC. Patient panel stability, we've heard that before. Um, Employer-sponsored patients are lower utilizers and reduced collection activities, fewer terminations for non-payment. Those are a few of the benefits. But here's the cautionary tale, and, and Dr. Smith mentioned it, um, but I'm going to reiterate. If you are a DPC practice that are, is thinking about potentially working with employers or working with their TPA, choose employers and TPAs carefully. Choose TPAs and employers that will not replace or interfere with your relationship with your patients. As we've talked all through this morning, that's great advice. Be wary of third parties. Um, I was, I actually uh, was on the phone um, with a association executive from one of the trade associations that I belong to for in the TPA industry is the uh, uh, Healthcare Administrators Association of America, HCAA. And they called Dr. Smith, actually sent Dr. Smith and I an email last night. So I was following up on that this morning. Called her and said, I'm actually, ironically enough, um, I'm at a DPC conference. I said, well, great, well, DPC is on our mind. I said, wonderful. Um, they were wanting to learn how can the FMMA and the HCAA work better together to educate. And she had said that she had had uh, a couple of DPCs had spoken to their group before. Uh, Lee, I think either you have or you soon will, Scheduled I think, for July. July. Las Vegas in February. Yeah, okay, February. So uh, she had mentioned, I said, great, you know, Lee's right across the hall. And she goes, yeah, we're very interested in DPC. Again, this is an association of TPAs. Um, and, she, and I said, well, you know, I'm here with 300. And I said, you know, um, I shared a little bit about what the topics of conversation were. She said, well, we're real eager to, to start learning more because, you know, uh, our TPAs are really interested in building their DPC network. I said, well, there's a problem right there. That's part of the education process. You're going to have to. And that's why I'm going to Las Vegas. You bet. <laughs> And, and she was stunned. She was, what do you mean? I said, you need to understand, they don't want to be part of your network. They don't want to, that, that in a way that does not intrude on your doctor-patient relationship, then that's going to be a success. Um, don't do that. The, the relation, you don't have a relationship anymore. It's a shotgun wedding, as we call it in Oklahoma. Patients got to have a personal and financial investment in DPC relationship with their health care. Okay, integration um, between DPC and a self-funded plan, kind of the next generation. Um, at the Kempton Group, my company, again, we're a family-owned TPA in Oklahoma City. I have 48, 49 employees, so we're not a, a giant company. We've been doing DPC, we're in our fourth year of DPC, and the way that, that we structured it in I would, what I would say the first generation was we provided a, uh, 
basically a, a sum of money, $75 a month, in a health reimbursement account. And if the employees chose to go out and find their own DPC, we made them aware of all the DPCs that we were aware of, sent them to uh, dpcfrontier.com and, and invited the DPCs in our local area to come to our office and talk to our employees about, about their, uh, their services. Um, but that was the way, that way it, it, it happened. Since I was paying um, funds out of a health plan, a uh, health reimbursement account, the IRS has a few strings attached to that. If I'm going to be providing a, a, a pre-tax payment to my employees that is not counted as payroll and taxable, then some of those strings are that we have to be able to document that, uh, that those fees are being paid for care that is defined by the Internal Revenue Code. In generation one of, of, of this project, we kind of put it on our employees to provide documentation. Okay, you know, if Jay gets audited, um, please go to your DPC and get a printout of all the care that you provided so I can hopefully stay out of jail. And we're a small enough company that that's what we did. The next generation, though, um, would look a little bit different, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, some DPCs may not want to or be able to work directly with employers. Uh, employers must be able to prove that the plan assets were spent on care and not access. Uh, I know you all have talked about that quite a bit. I'm hoping, just like you all are, that the IRS gets out of our way on that and let physicians be physicians. Um, however, if you are a DPC and you are looking to uh, work with employers, um, employer plans will, and again, don't shoot the messenger, but eventually that employer is going to want to and need to quantify the value of the DPC membership. There's some great vendors out in the hall that would help, but I do know that that is coming because I've talked to enough employers that they love DPC, but at some point they're going to say, well, how do I know this is really in my best interest to continue this subsidy? And if they conclude that it's not, I would hope that the patients would remain with DPC and just get the employer out of it. But if you are uh, a DPC practice that wants to attract and maintain those employer relationships, just know that eventually you are going to be asked to assist in quantifying um, the value. The regulations, I'm going to go really fast through these. Um, there, there's two pieces to it, really. Um, the Internal Revenue Code, Section 104-105, those are the sections in the code that allow an employer to offer benefits on a tax-free basis. That allows for the payment of these pre-tax benefits. Section 213 is actually the listing of the deductible medical expenses that an employer can cover on a pre-tax basis through their health plan. Again, both of those were written before DPC was even invented. So you're never, you're not going to see DP, we hope that we will see DPC care under one of those sections. But right now what the Internal Revenue uh, Code seems to be, have the best match is uh, like health club memberships, et cetera, are not a permissible expense under 213. Guess what? They have concluded, at least they're, they're coming along because of y'all's efforts and, and some of the folks that have made the trip to, uh, to D.C. and uh, Josh's stint on uh, Hannity. Um, but they're starting to, to come along, but, but they look at DPC, oh, that's just like concierge medicine, it's just like a health club. <laughs> that's a joke, but uh, that is where they're at right now. So to make this work, that's the hurdle that we've got to get over. Instead of saying, well, this is a DPC membership or this is a concierge um, uh, physician membership, we have to, from a health plan perspective, we have to look beyond the, the membership and we have to look at, we have to be able to document what's actually being done. Um, there's really three pieces to that. Um, and I will give a, a shout out uh, to a couple of the vendors. These are, this is not an all-inclusive list, and we love competition at the FMMA, so maybe others in the room will get into this business. But right now, the two that we feel like have come the furthest to be able to assist in these three areas that I'm going to go through in the next eight minutes uh, are Hint and KPI Ninja. 
Uh, again, they, they seem to touch the bases, um, so if you are interested, you could uh, certainly talk to those folks uh, or others. First off, um, from, from a, a TPA's perspective, we have to have technology with the DPC or the DPC's vendor uh, to be able to synchronize the plan's eligibility. When I say plan, you just think of the folks that are covered by the, uh, the self-funded benefit plan. We have to be able to synchronize who is, who is on that coverage with um, the DPC um, clinic. And it's kind of like sending the uh, a, a, a listing of the possible universe of patients that could, could uh, sign up at that particular clinic with that particular employer. Employer enrollment, it, it goes up and down as employers hire people or they, can, they, they grow or they contract at their business. So there would be a, a monthly file feed to have uh, the DPC practice know who works at ABC Wholesale uh, on a month in, month out basis. Um, once you know who is, is eligible, um, I believe that the way I've heard it would work, there would be a custom landing page on the DPC Clinic's um, sign-up portal that if you belong to ABC Wholesale, click here. And that would then bang against that eligibility and make sure that if, you're, if it's Sally Sue, is Sally Sue actually covered by ABC Wholesale for that month? If the answer is yes, then Sally can go ahead and enroll and then the employer would provide the subsidy back to the DPC clinic for Sally Sue for that month. Again, the amount of the subsidy would be up to the employer. I always suggest that don't pay for the whole thing. Sally needs to have a little skin in the game and the DPC clinic needs to have a personal and a financial relationship with Sally. Second would be the technology that allows uh, the sharing of the, actually I just said that, um, but again, allows that monthly eligibility um, uh, synchronization so we know how many uh, subsidies will be paid based on how many of the um, uh, patients for that employer sign up. And then third, and this is the one that I hope you all don't lynch me uh, on the way out, uh, but it would, we would also need technology that allows for the proper benefit substantiation. substantiation. Um, in our world, and this is where you're going to start having that old sinking feeling again, thinking we're dragging you back into the swamp, but um, most uh, TPA claim systems, even the good guys, we have been standardized and homogenized just like you all have when you were uh, in the system. Uh, our claim systems, they speak uh, EDI 837, which is a HIPAA transaction set. I hate it. I wish it, was, I wish it didn't exist. I wish that we could intake just a narrative about what the patient uh, did. In fact, I wish we didn't even have to collect this information, but we do right now. Hopefully that'll go away soon. But our systems generally speak EDI 837, which is a claims file. As I understand it, um, KPI Ninja is very adept at taking the information that is provided uh, through the DPC's um, EMR system and converting that into an 837. You don't have to speak 837. In fact, you can just purge that from your brain as soon as they get done talking. You don't need to know about it, but know that uh, there is at least one vendor that can convert that to an 837. It is a claims file, but I don't, we're not looking to pay claims. We're not looking to pay you. I don't want to get, I don't want to do business with you, remember? This would, send, we would be stripping out or ignoring any of the payment fields. This is simply to be able to document back to the IRS what was the diagnosis and what was done at, at, at the encounter, whether it be telemedicine, um, text, in person, et cetera. Um, that is really the long and the short of it uh, when it comes to that. Um, I hate to be building a mousetrap that I hope just disappears, um, but that is where we're at. Um, we've been very successful 
the FMMA has that we're opening a lot of employers' eyes uh, to this movement, to what you all bring to the table. And we are just know, if you've ever been to a DP or excuse me, an FMMA conference, that we also instruct the employers, the consultants, et cetera, on what the medical community doesn't want. What is your nightmare? We're always looking for good guys and good gals to work with as a TPA for our employers. And that's you. But we, want, we don't want to take what you all are doing here, which is so powerful and so important, and ruin it by layering in a bunch of garbage that is what got you all here in the first place. We're very cognizant of that. And so I hope that I can come back in a year or two and tell you about a whole bunch of other things and say, remember that speech I gave back in late 2018? Isn't it great that all that's gone? But right now it's here. So thank you all very much.